Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you once again to Living Well. I am so glad that you um, that you all, you all have taken the time out to come again to join us on this platform. You know, the information that we are going to provide to you today is for educational purposes only. Whatever we say here today, if you want to make any changes in your in your life, in you know, with your health, our advice is that you first seek out your professional provider, your um, physician or nurse practitioner, who it might be, um, of the changes that you want to make before you implement these changes. The uh, presentations that we present here are from our experience, from research that we have done, and also backed by the Bible. So I want to welcome you again to Living Well. We are so glad that you are here today to join us. Today, we are going to be talking about something that we, have, we haven't spoken about since this platform started. It's talking about ad adrenals, adrenals, adrenals. A very important gland that we have that is a powerhouse that manages different various functions in the body and that we need to learn how to manage it. So it's such a vast subject that we decided that we're going to put it into two sections. So today, Josephine Johnson will be presenting part one. Josephine is a licensed dietitian um, nutritionist. She's also a registered dietitian and she has a certificate in functional nutrition. So she is quite capable of talking about this, this um, topic about adren adrenals. So without any further ado, I want to welcome you, Josephine, back to our platform. And I'm glad that you have taken this opportunity to discuss such an important subject. It would be very difficult to explain to what is needed. Thanks for um, coming on and the platform is yours. Okay, thank you, Emmalyn. Now I have to find my little computer and the screen is not cooperating. I don't know why every week it gives us this trouble. But the, the images of the people, the people, they're on my... They're on your screen? They're on the little, okay, hold on, my little computer. Okay. Can yeah. you see it? Yes, we can see your screen. All right. So, part one, I'm going to have trouble because I'm not going to see all my slides. I don't know what's going on. So at the end of the presentation, we, we we should be able to know and describe the adrenal glands and the function of the adrenal glands. We have here, okay, that's how they look. We have the kidneys and on top of the kidneys, you have the adrenal glands. They are small, triangular shaped, and they're also called suprarenal glands because supra means above, so they are above the kidneys, and they are surrounded by a capsule of fat for protective purposes. The adrenal glands, they are part of the endocrine system, which I'll just share about two slides about that. And they produce certain hormones that help regulate several important bodily functions. They regulate our metabolism, our immune system, blood pressure, response to stress and development of estrogen and 
progesterone. Now the endocrine system comprises of a complex network of glands and organs. And via hormones, it, the endocrine system controls and coordinates the body's metabolism, energy level, reproduction, growth, development, response to injury, stress, and mood. So there are a number of glands that are part of the endocrine system. And you have the hypothalamus, the pineal gland, the pituitary gland, the parathyroid, and the thyroid glands, the thymus, the ovaries, testes, pancreas, they're all part of the endocrine system. And this is a picture of those I just called out. You have the pituitary gland up in the head and also the thyroid gland there in the neck, thymus, adrenal, just to show you where these things are located in the body. And then you have the adrenal gland as part of that whole network. Now the adrenal glands are composed of two parts. Each part is responsible for producing different hormones. There are hormone secreting glands that produce chemical messengers that travel from one endocrine gland to another. So first part, we have the cortex of the adrenal gland, which is the outer region that produces cortisol and aldosterone. And it's a, it is the largest part of the adrenal gland. The medulla, which is the inner part, produces epinephrine, which is adrenaline, and norepinephrine, which is norepirine. And we're gonna talk more about those later. And this is a picture of the adrenal gland, the cross section. It's about five grams in weight. Some say it's yellow, some say it's orange, two inches high and three inches long. And it is sometimes referred to as the kidney's hat because it sits on top of the kidney. So how does the adrenal gland get to know that it should start working? So it receives signal from the pituitary gland in the brain. And the pituitary gland receives signal from the hypothalamus, also located in the brain. And this is referred to as the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So the acronym for that is HPA, the HPA axis. And that is co connected to the central nervous system and the endocrine system. And here we have how it works. We have the pathway that the signal travels from the hypothalamus. There's a hormone, the corticotroph, Pain releasing hormone comes from the pineal, from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. And the adrenocorticotropin hormone comes from the pituitary gland down to the adrenal gland. So that's how it gets a signal and is often referred to as a stress response. Now the adrenal glands produce hormones that help regulate the body's metabolism. You have cortisol, aldosterone, adrenaline, and the precursors of androgen and estrogen. These hormones help to regulate metabolism, blood pressure, response to stress, immune system, development of sexual characteristics, and other essential functions. 
we're going to take a look at those hormones that I just called out. The first one we're going to look at is cortisol, which is a steroid hormone that comes from the adrenal gland. And it affects several aspects of the body. It mainly helps regulate your body's response to stress. So it is known as a stress hormone. It is involved in helping the body get its fuel for the fight or flight instinct in a crisis. Now that picture I showed you with the pathway is called a positive feedback. It increases the system output but when there's a negative feedback, which goes the opposite direction, it decreases it. So just as cortisol initiates a positive response feedback loop by stimulating the activation of our fight flight response, it also creates a negative feedback loop by sending a signal to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland to calm down or chill out. So individuals who experience chronic stress, however, become more resistant to the signals that tell the body to calm down. And this can lead to significant mental and physical health problems. And cortisol also has the power to dial down those functions that won't help in a stressful situation. So if, if something that wanna help in a stressful situation, cortisol shuts that off. So you'll have more energy to use with the other functions. And this is a negative feedback loop. See, it's going, the hours are going the opposite direction than the positive feedback loop. Cortisol affects the following systems, the nervous system, immune, cardiovascular, respiratory, male and female reproductive systems, and the musculoskeletal system. Types of stress that cortisol is involved in is you have acute stress, there's sudden danger within a short period of time. Example, if you barely avoid a car accident or being chased by an animal, it also has chronic long-term stress, which is ongoing, that causes frustration or anxiety, like having a chronic illness, traumatic stress, which can which is term life-threatening, that induces fear and feeling of hopelessness if you have like earthquakes, sexual assault, terrible hurricanes, and this can lead to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So the body releases cortisol when these events are experienced. The exact response depends on the type of stress, whether it's short-term or long-term, so if you have an argument or a fall, you see a, a brief spike in cortisol and it may last for a few hours. For longer term stressors like work stress or illness, we see a consistently higher level of cortisol at all times of the day. So if the body makes too much cortisol, people can end up with a diagnosis of Cushing's disease. And if it makes too little cortisol, you can have a diagnosis of Addison's disease. So extremes are not good. So we have to learn to keep our stress under control. You can have inflammation, weakened immune system, 
high blood pressure, high, high sugar, anxiety, depression. If we have too much cortisol, prolonged cortisol. Cortisol also helps to control the sleep cycle, sleep and wake cycle. Under, no, under normal circumstances, the body will have lower cortisol levels in the evening when you go to sleep and peak. It will peak in the morning right before you wake up and it's called a diurnal rhythm, which suggests that cortisol plays a significant role in a circadian rhythm. It will vary throughout the day. And its levels are a good indicator of the body's stress response and the HPA axis function. In those persons that work at night, there's a reversal in cortisol release in time due to altered sleep-wake cycles. The pattern and timing of the release of cortisol is reversed to allow for higher levels throughout the late evening and early morning hours. And those persons who travel long distances and have jet lag may experience similar cortisol levels. So those of us, those persons like my friend Emin, who used to work night, there's some things that you can do, or those of us who have night shifts in different careers, you can sleep in the day, accumulate rest ahead of time before you go to work, go to sleep, and be consistent. Maintain consistent wake up and bedtime hours, even if they are flipped due to night shifts, because consistency helps regulate cortisol patterns. You can also block out the light, you know, to do that well, put up your shut your, shut, close down your windows, pull your curtains, get some heavy curtains, turn off the light. You can wear an eye mask, keep things quiet, have a comfortable sleep environment. Some people can't sleep when it's hot. So you have a comfortable temperature in the room, like 65 degrees. You can put earplugs, etc. Take turn off your phone. But if you are on call, that might be not possible. Otherwise, turn off your cell phone to avoid sleep disturbances and stop picking at your phone. Go to sleep and because all these light, all these devices emit a blue light. You know, I know about that. And it can make it difficult for you to fall asleep. So you have your TV, tablets, all of those things, you turn them off. And if you are living with people, you ask them to be quiet while you get rest and they should respect that. So in the morning, cortisol levels are highest. In the afternoon, cortisol starts to decline. Around eight o'clock in the night, it decreases further. And around midnight, it's, it reaches its lowest level. And by the time you get up in the morning again, it, it go right back up to its highest level. So you can have energy, gives you the energy to get up and go in the morning. And if you don't feel like getting up and go because you feel fatigued, because something is wrong, which we're going to talk about next presentation, what, what can go wrong with the adrenals, and that's part of it. So this is a graph of how your adrenal, how cortisol levels go throughout the day. So it peaks when you get up and it starts going down throughout the day. And when you fall asleep, it's the lowest. And when you get up in the morning again, it is high. To give you the energy, the get up and go energy. Another hormone that that you know, glands secrete 
is a hormone called aldosterone. It regulates and maintain blood pressure. And it works by managing the sodium and potassium levels in the blood. It controls the fluid levels in the body by making the kidneys and colon excrete more potassium and absorb more sodium, leading to water retention. And it also maintains the pH balance of the fluid in your body, electrolyte. So if you have high aldosterone, you can end up with hypertension, headache, muscle weakness, extreme thirst. So you need to talk to your doctor about all these signs and symptoms that you may be experiencing. And if you have low aldosterone, you have low blood pressure, muscle weakness, nausea, heart palp palpit aspect with palpitations, irregular heartbeat, and the same thing. See a doctor about these things that you're experiencing. Now, adrenaline, also known as epinephrine, is a type of hormone that is released whenever a person experiences fear, anxiety, or stress. So this is the hormone that triggers the fight or flight response. It prepares the body to either fight or flee from danger by increasing blood circulation and breathing. While this response is crucial to survival, overexposure to adrenaline can be damaging to a person's health. The adrenaline works by stimulating a part of the nervous system known as the sympathetic nervous system that regulates the body's unconscious actions. It is released at times of physical and emotional stress by the adrenal glands, which are situated on top of the kidney. <clears throat> Sorry. So the central, the nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, the network of it increases the body's activity and mobilizes its resources when in danger, stressed, or physically active. So when adrenaline is released, it affects the body in six key ways. Air passages widen to provide muscles with the oxygen they need to either fight or flee danger. Blood vessels narrow to redirect blood flow to major muscle groups, including the heart and lungs. Your heart rate speeds up and the oxygen contract, and the heart contracts more forcefully so that more oxygen is delivered to muscles and tissues that need it at the moment. Also, the liver releases blood sugar, which provides the body with energy. The pupils of your eyes dilate so that you can see more clearly, even if it's dark. Perception of pain, known as stress-induced analgesia, is reduced so that you can continue fighting or fleeing, even if you are injured. Then we go to androgen and estrogen. Androgens like testosterone are male hormones that help regulate sex characteristics in the body. So let us know that everybody has androgens, man and woman. But men typically have higher levels of androgens. And testosterone is the most common androgen. They have others with some long names. And the testicles in the male reproductive system and the ovaries in the female reproductive system make androgens. So it's not just a man thing. You all have, you all have them. So androgens increase around puberty. In all genders, they're key to 
muscle growth, bone density, red blood cell production, puberty, sexual desire and function. Those persons who are assigned male at birth, androgens typically support the vocal cords, vocal cord lengthening and voice deepening. Here growth on face, scalp, chest, armpits and genitals, sperm development. And those who are assigned female at birth, androgens are converted to estradiol, which is a type of estrogen. And this process is key to menstruation, conception and pregnancy. Here growth on pubic area and armpits and min to help minimize bone loss. There are some persons who may born, they call it intersex. I guess mo most of us know what that is. They may have some of both. You're neither man nor woman. That's how they are born. They have a name for that. So they have some of each. Now, estrogen is also produced in male and female. Impacts more areas of health than we may think. The focus here is on estrogen in females. So those of us who were born female, the role of estrogen goes beyond fertility and sex-related functions. It also has protective effects on mood, mental health, bone strength and even heart health. And it nowadays, I guess we have heard that it, it is linked to breast cancer. So there are several types of estrogen. We have estrone, which is E1. It is produced in the body after menopause. Estradiol, produced by the ovaries, strongest, it's the strongest estrogen and it's most common in women of childbearing age. And the estriol is a waste product made after the body uses estradiol. Besides being found in women's ovaries, placenta and breasts, estrogen can occur in skin, bone, brain, and liver. And this can be explained why many of the symptoms like hot flashes, muscle aches, and mood, mood swings influence several aspects of health. Okay, in conclusion, so we learned that the adrenal glands our endocrine glands located on top of the kidneys and they produce important hormones that help to regulate several bodily functions so we can stay healthy. And whenever I read about the body, my mind flashes back to this Psalm, Psalm 139. And I like Verses 13 to 15 from the New King James Version. And it said, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. So that's the brief presentation for today. Next presentation, we'll talk about what can go wrong with the adrenal glands, diseases of the adrenal glands, like adrenal fatigue, I guess you have heard that terminology, adrenal fatigue. What can we do about it? What causes it? What can we do and how to take care of our adrenal glands? Thank you. Thank you, Jetafine, for that presentation. 
Um, now we are going to open up the floor for any questions, discussions that you may have. Anyone? You know, I like that text you quoted at the end. Because as you were talking about the, um, the adrenals, I keep going over in my mind how fearfully and wonderfully we are made. Because these little signals, you know, the, the way the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland and send message down from the pituitary gland down to the adrenals. Just enough, it sends just enough to stimulate that gland to produce all these different hormones that is essential for the functioning of our bodies. Essential for controlling blood pressure, instead of controlling um, glucose, um, stress levels, the sex hormones, you know, and very important for all of these different um, hormones and organs that that um, need to function just by a little um, um, signal of a gland producing these okay, so different hormones. And the body has a way, if it's too much, it has a way how to deregulate. It has a way um, how to deregulate de that hormone so it doesn't produce too much. And if it's not enough, it pumps it up so it can produce enough. Mm -hmm. It's only God, it's only a creator can create something so marvelous so that we can function effectively. And when these um, organs, when, when, these, when the hypothalamus is not functioning properly, you cannot send that signal down to the pituitary gland and then to the adrenal gland. We have a cascade of, of issues. So it's very, very important that we take care of these glands. And next week we're going to talk about how we can take care of these of these glands. I know just when you talk. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the presentation. I I remember studying the adrenal glands in school, in nursing school, but really because they're not as, you know, we don't think of them as pumping as the heart or breathing as the lungs or kidneys, you know, as the kid being the primary function of the kidneys. Many times we do not realize that when we are having difficulty dealing with stress or when we're having difficulty with um, regulating just our hormones, it could be that our adrenal, adrenal glands are not functioning well. And so I appreciate that you brought back to our attention where are they located and what they, what do they do? Um, because really what they're doing is making sure that we have homeostasis throughout the body. I mean, they play such a vital role. And of course, I love studying stress. Uh, that's one of my topics. And so when you talked about the role of the adrenal in the cortisol regulation, that really piqued my interest because now we need to help people understand that it's not just that you're afraid or that you have a fight or flight going on. The body, the adrenal glands actually control that. So thank you, Josephine. I do appreciate it. Yeah. You know, I appreciate it was the time of day when cortisol is the highest and when it is the, you know, when it peaks really high in the morning, then it declines and then it gets lowest at night. And my one question I was thinking was, you know, are people more likely to have higher levels of stress in the morning or or as the day goes on, do their stress levels go down? I don't know. I'm not sure if you saw any literature pertaining some to people, that. Some people have stress all day. Right. They get them in the morning, they're stressed to get to work. Mm -hmm. Go to work, they stress. They're coming back home, you have to drive in this crazy traffic. That is stress. And when you come home, especially if you have a family at home waiting for you, you have to come home, that is more stress. So that is not a good position to be in, to, to be stressed all day. It can have negative effects on your health. So you have to find a way to combat and get, get out. Do something to get rid of some of these stress. Go to a psychologist, somebody to talk about how to, how to help you manage your day. You have to 
plan your day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you talked about prolonged stress. Is I think stress for certain points is okay because mm -hmm. when we when we have you know that stress to defend ourselves or stress you know if we have to do something you know your boss maybe procrastinated and then at the last minute tells you oh you have to do this presentation for tomorrow and then you know you have that stress built up in you so that you can quickly get these things together so you can get the presentation that is okay but what we have to be careful is from, from what mm -hmm. i understand you said prolonged stress prolonged stress what causes adrenal fatigue and that is where the problem comes in so the Lord built in cortisol into our system. He gave us that because he realized that there will be times when we need to use it. And that's why we have these peak high and lows with cortisol levels. So what we need to avoid is the prolonged stress in our lives. It's our, let me see, I'm wondering how many persons, how many persons knew about the adrenal glands. I just started learning about it probably three years ago. I talked to someone today and tell them the topic we are going to do. And they say, what is that? Yeah. I've never heard. And the person is almost 46. They've never heard of the adrenal glands. That's because as... Dr. Sank is saying we don't talk about it. We talk about the heart and all, all the lungs, etc. But we don't talk about. And there are, there are other systems in the body that we don't talk about, which if we get to know, we may find out certain things about why we feel this way and why this is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so true. I agree with you, Josephine. Yeah. Yeah, I think the um talking about hormones is could be such a, a complicated subject mm -hmm. because um it's so many different things affect you know it's it's like a cascade of of yeah. effects and the way you know the system is is formulated is you know starts with the hypothalamus and you have the positive feedback and the negative feedback and it has the you know the different organs that they stimulate and what these different organs do when they're stimulated and when they're not. So it's a very complicated subject. So I guess maybe that's why it's not talked about so much, maybe, but it's something that we really need to talk about because our hormones regulate every organ, every muscle, every tissue, every cell in our body. Mm -hmm. It's regulated by hormones and we need to understand. And as you said, Josephine, if we understand why we are feeling a certain way, then we can, you know, um, help ourselves. We can say, okay, I need maybe to take some deep breath, you know, breaths because I'm feeling stressed. I'm having this anxiety um, approaching me, and I know it's because of my cortisol level. I'm just overstressing myself, so I need to sit down and just start taking some deep breaths to have relax, you know, relax myself. You have tests. You have tests for for them. That, that you could go and get a test if you're curious. They have blood tests, urine tests, saliva tests. Um, they have home testing. You can do that at home. However, that is I didn't go into that, but they have kits that they, you can get and you test test it at home. Right, you can test your cortisol. Yeah, to see where you are. Because I, I I did the home test with the saliva. They said the saliva test is better because it gives you a better accurate reading throughout the day. Because I had to test it in the morning. There were different times in the day I had to go test it, and then put it in these little samples and send it off. So you can you can measure the um the level at these different times. Because as you were talking about, it peaks in the morning and it slowly start going down, and by evening night time it should be the lowest. And that's maybe a problem why some people have difficulty falling asleep because mm -hmm. maybe their cortisol level is still too high, so therefore they cannot sleep. Or it peaks too early in the morning that they wake up. Um, some people wake up during maybe 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock in the morning and cannot go back to sleep. It could be because of the cortisol level peaking too high at that time, and then they just cannot go back to sleep. Yep. 
Yeah. So it's one good quick, to to get those tests done. One quick question. Uh, this is Stan. Uh, I'm guessing it's because of the cortisone level is cortisol level is high in the morning, but I've always felt my highest energy early in the morning to exercise. And I've always wanted to exercise early in the morning because I felt the strongest. And then later in the day, I didn't wasn't feeling quite as energized, but early in the morning was is always when I try to get it in. I'm guessing that it's because it's highest in the morning. Yes, I guess it may vary with with everyone, your individuals, and what may be your highest point may not be mine, but following that graph I showed you, that is a normal wave. And then if you have night shifts, it is wonderful. It reverses itself so you can get proper rest, but you have to work with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess Stan's um, cortisol peaks early in the morning. Yeah, because I know for myself, I, I've worked nights for hmm, over 30 years. And um, I can, and now I'm retired, I am still having that difficulty of in the morning getting things done because I'm just like dragging. I have to really get myself going. And in the evening time, that's when I feel I'm the at the highest, highest point. Because for all those years, I have been working nights, so my body re-regulated itself where my cortisol level was lower in the day and peaks in the evening. And when I did my tests, when I did that cortisol test, that's what it showed. You know, mm -hmm. I had higher levels in the evening time from here to night to, yeah, to the morning time. So I was kind of in the reverse. You see, our body adapts. Our body knows how to adapt to different situations. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks again, Josephine, for, for doing that presentation and for bringing that topic to our attention. Um, if we don't have any more questions, let me check the chat to make sure. Okay, Larry's having some problems hearing. Um, it might be with your computer, Larry, because I do not think anybody else is having that issue. So I hope maybe you can check your computer. I'm not a technician, so I don't know how, how to tell you to fix it, but it might be. I'll try to follow up with Larry after the program and maybe hear more specifically what the issue is. Um, I, I'm not a troubleshooter 100%, but I may be able to help him. Okay, great. And we want everyone to hear what we have to say. Absolutely. Okay, so we are going to stop recording and um, go to the next section.